Your Royal Highness. Lovely to see you. Great to see you. You made it. You said this is a very special place for you in the past. You've said this is your happy place. What is so special about, about Burke Hall and Balmoral? Well, I, I mean, I think one of the most marvellous things is it's by this river called the Nick. And it has this wonderful sound of, of rushing water when you're in the house. It's very calming and peaceful, I think. Tell us about the Arboretum, because this is something you planted. This was a, a, a rather empty field that the farm didn't need anymore. So I thought, ah. And the great thing was I managed to plant it the same year that my grandson was born, the eldest, George. So I thought I'd call it Prince George's oh, This word. is Prince George's word? Basically, yes. All of our grandchildren, if we're lucky enough to have them, will inherit the earth that we bequeath them, won't they? I mean, how worried are you about the state of that inheritance? Deeply worried. But I, I've always felt that we're you know, over-exploiting and... and uh, damaging nature by not understanding how much we depend on everything that nature provides and also not understanding or having been somehow trained to believe that nature is a separate thing from us and we can just exploit uh, and control and suppress everything about her without suffering the consequences. But if you look into the way nature operates, the universal principles, which of course the world of Islam understood so well, having inherited it from the Greeks and the Egyptians, is that underlying everything are the fundamental patterns in the universe. What we're doing with our own economy is to disrupt nature's economy by not following that circular pattern. We've created a linear one, which imagines you can go on forever, creating ever more growth and ever more, you know, changing everything, you see what I mean, without understanding that actually you have to fit together with nature and the way she does it. But because we haven't done that, we've caused mammoth disruption and now we've disorganized and disrupted the whole planet's system of um, climate of regulation. Climate regulation. That's what I really minded about. And I minded about balance and harmony because I felt that if you push things too far, you will always create an equal and opposite reaction, which is exactly what's happened. But in the meantime, if you're, if you're the idiot who suggests all this, you're immediately accused of being an idiot. Well, that, and that is exactly what happened. You were, you know, you were, you know, you got a lot of stick, if you don't mind me saying. I was accused of being anti-science. Yeah, yeah, well, you got a lot of stick for kind of, you know, talking about nature, talking about the climate. I mean, you were teased, I remember, for talking to your plants <laughs> and that kind of thing. I mean, but you can't did, make a joke, you see, otherwise, that's the other thing. Did, did that hurt, though? Did it hurt to get that kind of criticism and be sort of parody? <laughs> it wasn't much fun, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, and then, of course, because I suggested that there were better ways of doing things and the nicest possible way, and a more balanced and integrated way of doing things, I was accused of interfering and meddling. And but this is what's so interesting, coming back kind of 50 years later and talking here in this beautiful garden of yours, that the narrative has changed. You know, and lots of the things that you said are now mainstream. It's taken far too long. World leaders are gathering in Glasgow to talk about the kind of issues that you were... Yeah, but they just talk. And the problem is to get action on the ground, which is what I've been trying to do for the last 40 years. You sound a little bit like Greta Thunberg, who said exactly the same thing. She said it's all, I don't know, you probably saw, she said it's all blah, blah, blah. Build back bladder, blah, blah, blah. I mean, do you feel that she's kind of onto something? Yes, of course. She, but I mean, why do you think I've done all this for all these years? Because I'm minded about, and always have done, the next generations. I mean, do you sympathise with her, sort of, the anger that she feels and that she expresses? And yes. That? Because I knew in the end, people will get fed up and all these young feel nothing is ever happening. So of course they're going to get frustrated. I totally understand. And because nobody would listen and they see their future being totally destroyed. What about, what about the people who protest? What about kind of Extinction Rebellion? Can you empathise with why you might go out onto the streets and say, take this issue seriously? Well, absolutely, I'll tell you something. <laughs> Extinction Rebellion came and did, made a sit-in in my driveway at Hygris. They left a, you know, a letter behind saying very nice things and saying that um, you know, back in such and such a time, you said such and such, you were right. Then in 19 something or other, you said you were, you were right, you were oh, right, so you were right. To, they came to congratulate so they, you. Yes, <laughs> as marvelous. That was the right kind of demonstration. Was no, but do you understand why they go yes, out Yes, of course I do. Yes, but it isn't helpful, I don't think, to do it in a way that alienates people. So 
I totally understand the frustration. The difficulty is how do you direct that frustration in a way that is more constructive rather than destructive. So, I mean, the point is that people should really notice how despairing so many young are. Do you get the sense that, that the big corporations kind of know that this is an issue, you know, not that goes beyond business and is about them, you know, ensuring there's a, a, an earth for us all? There's been a, a suddenly a, a kind of dam bursting, particularly with the uh, investor community who are now being pressured by their investors, by their shareholders, by all mm. these people to... to to make a real difference in terms of sustainable investment opportunities. So I remember this is what you said at the G7 in Cornwall was, you know, it's all very well talking to governments, but the governments can bring billions, corporations can trillions. bring trillions to the battle. But the difficulty then is how, how do you unlock all those trillions of dollars uh, with the assistance of the public sector? That's the key, because at the moment, all the different solutions to the problems we face technologically and other ways and natural solutions, uh, none of them are considered economic. So let me ask you this, is our government doing enough to make these things happen? I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> We're all struggling to deal with our own kind of dilemmas about our impact, personal impact on the environment. And it, 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 it's true to say that you've got a pretty hefty carbon footprint. I mean, yes. put it like this, it must take a lot of gas to heat a palace. Yes, yes, but I have tried for a very long time to make sure that the heating is done in a way that is as sustainable as possible. So, I mean, I put in, uh, you know, biomass boiler systems and then the solar panels, which I've managed to get onto Clarence House and, and at Highgrove on, on some of the farm buildings and every kind of thing like that, air source pumps here and there, plus, you know, trying to reduce as much as possible. So I've got electric cars now it's been so difficult i, I can't do it single-handedly one thing that not everybody knows about you is you are a bit of a a clarkson is it fair to say <laughs> jeremy clarkson a bit, <laughs> of, a, really, a, bit really. of a kind of petrol head and you've always enjoyed no, cars no. You have, you've no, enjoyed no. cars well yes yes but um that was before we knew what the problems were particularly but i my old aston martin which i've had for 51 years that runs on can you believe this surplus english white wine you and and away from the cheese process. And, but you did that a long time ago. Well, I did quite a long time ago. I'm really keen to know what you think of electric vehicles, because I know that you've tried quite a few of them. Yes. Now, you're not wholly impressed, but you like the technology, I think it's fair to yes, say. Yes, yes. But I also think that we mustn't forget the importance of hydrogen in this mix. It can't all be done with electric vehicles. There are problems with batteries and, you know, how you source the materials. and Can you recycle them properly? And so at the moment... There's a huge amount of waste, which is really worrying in that sense, which we could, we should be able to reclaim in some way and reuse. So what would you say to people watching this in terms of diet? Should they be eating less meat? Should they be flying less? Flying has been done much less recently. I mean, most of its people have done things online, as I've been trying to do, trying to get used to that. Mm. Um, the business of, of what we eat, of course, is important. I mean, I've, <laughs> for years, I've, I haven't eaten meat and fish on two days a week. And I don't eat dairy products on one day a week. Now, I mean, that's one way to do it. If you did that, if more did that, you would reduce a lot of the pressure on the environment and everything else. So you're not saying don't, you're you're saying not, don't no, cut it absolutely out. Absolutely not. Just be more moderate. Because you see, the thing about meat, I think, is it's very important is where does it come from? How is it grown? So if it's grass-based forage and more extensive systems of the right breeds, you know, if, if better quality but less often. That approach to farming is, is less damaging than the industrialised approach with intensive everything, you know, and, and causing huge pressures and damage. What can you do if we are still, we still have in place endless perverse subsidy regimes? We still have subsidies for insane agri-industrial uh, approaches to, to, to farming, which are a disaster in many ways, cause huge damage and contribute enormously to, to emissions. And we still have in perverse subsidies for fishing in the oceans, causing, again, mammoth damage, trawling up the bottom, deep trawling, crazy.
You've made a great case for why we need to take action on this. There are some governments that seem reluctant to accept the urgency <laughs> of this. What I mean, uh, I don't want to single out in... Well, I do want to single out some individual countries. Uh, Australia, for example, what would you say to a government like the government of Australia that seems reluctant to take on board the need to take really serious ash action on this issue? No. I mean, you gently try to suggest there may be other ways of doing things. Um, in my case, anyway. <laughs> Otherwise, you lot accuse me of interfering and meddling, don't you? Scott Morrison, the Australian PM, isn't even certain that he could make it to the meeting in Glasgow? I... Is that what he says, is he? He, he did say, yeah. yeah. He said he's well, spent enough time in quarantine. I mean, what would you say to world leaders about why they should come to Glasgow? Well, that's what I'm <laughs> trying to say all the time. And, and the point being that this is a last chance saloon. Literally, because if we don't really take the decisions that are vital now, it's going to be almost impossible to catch up. There will be people watching this, you know this is true, oh, yes. who will be sceptical and they'll say, listen, the UK produces like 1% of world emissions, other countries aren't doing their bit, why on earth should we make this huge effort and kind of hobble our economies uh, for something which ultimately will be useless. What would you say to them about why this is urgent and what's at stake for, for them, but also for the world? It will be a disaster. I mean, it'll be catastrophic. It is already beginning to be catastrophic because nothing in nature can survive the stress that is created by these extremes of, of weather. We're busily destroying, still, through deforestation and the destruction of, 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 of habitats that are so rapid dwindling, you know, we're destroying our future by making extinct things that have not been discovered by science. We've got this big, big, critical, I think it's fair to say, vital conference happening in Glasgow, world leaders coming together to make decisions about what they're going to do in terms of tackling climate change. What would a successful outcome be? Well, as I've been saying, I, to unlock the, the vast amount of money and investment opportunity there is to to make the transition to a more sustainable and a circular economy happen quicker having discussed these issues what would your what would your ideal for a future britain look like what do you want britain to become in i don't know, i mean beyond our lifetimes 50 years time i don't want to offer a hostage to fortune because i should be held to say oh we didn't happen you know well, no, give it. us just an idea well yes i mean for instance there's a hell of a lot that it could be like and i I think we should be leading the way, particularly in terms of, of how uh, we could, as an island, I've always felt that we could have a, an enormous uh, impact as somewhere which was renowned for its environmental quality, the way we farm uh, and the kind of products we produce and how they are related to telling a story about the, the place, the people, you know, the culture, and the traditions of, of, of these areas, but also that we have you know, restored lost habitat, not just planting great big forests everywhere, but looking, for instance, at you know, re, replacing, replanting hedgerows where they were taken out. So a lot of parts of Britain are just prairie farms. Mm. We could put that back. You could just hedgerow trees and hedges, they will capture a lot of carbon, plus avenues, because one of the things I've been wanting to do it, avenues it, of trees. Yes, I've been wanting to help plant avenues of trees which could commemorate all the people who've died during this pandemic. When you think what a difference, you know, uh, urban trees make, mm. and yet at the moment councils keep cutting them down and saying they get in the way or lighting. It. But we need you know, avenues would be another way, mm. and they're wonderful in the landscape as well. Can we go and have a look at the? Cho are they called chokeberries? But the extraordinary thing is none of the birds eat them. But they are but really... But there are different varieties of them. I wouldn't... No, it was all right. Yeah, should no, be. Exactly. There are better ones. They're a bit, bit tart. They're slightly astringent. Your Royal Highness, can I say that was a fantastic interview. Thank you very much indeed for spending so much time with us. And it was lovely to see this wonderful yeah. garden. Thank you. It's such a treat to be in the no, Prince no. George Garden. Thank no, you very no, much no. indeed. I just hope he appreciates it one day. But I'm sure he will. <laughs> no. People get older and they suddenly change, don't they, really? Well, your priorities change as you get older, don't you? And you suddenly Anything. see the value yeah. in trees. Yeah. And